previously in the complete creation. If you get over to a place called Sugarloaf Mountain, as far as the eye can see, yes, there are mountains, but the moment the mountain hits a certain height, it's planed off flat. They all are. If you turn around and look towards Newfoundland, that mountain is planed off just as flat and at the same elevation as the others. Let's take the ferry across that water over to the island of Newfoundland and immediately you are met with Table Mountains, all planed off at the same height. You can follow these plain mountains now for hundreds of kilometers. Thank you for checking it again as we continue on our journey through this vast video encyclopedia of information on the creation evolution debate. In the last lecture, we were examining the incredible traveling rocks of Western North America with quartzite boulders recording their tumultuous trip in the form of marks caused by the rocks hammering against each other. We saw how the only possible explanation is incredibly fast moving water, at least 55 meters deep, ripping apart rock layers in Idaho and breaking up those rocks, rounding and pounding them together and dropping them off in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Montana on the tops of mountains which have been planed off flat by the moving water. The water had to have been moving at highway speeds at minimum. So all of those rocks probably made the 1,000 kilometer trip in less than 12 hours. We then looked at another example of plain mountains, which in the example we looked at was literally the entire east coast of Canada. The obvious conclusion is that such erosion by massive, fast moving sheets of water equate to a flood literally of global proportions. This was a flood across the entire eastern seaboard of Canada, 800 meters above sea level. A sheet of water deep enough to carry away the ripped up sediments of tens of thousands of square kilometers and moving fast enough to erode down rocks to a completely flat surface regardless of how incredibly tough, hard or soft some of those rocks were. You cannot have such a flood on such a huge regional scale without simultaneously having a flood on every other continent. That's just simple physics and extrapolation. Interestingly, we find the evidence of this flood on every continent in the planet, including Eurasia, Africa, and even Antarctica. This sheet flow occurs while the water velocity is fast enough to have complete disregard for rock hardness, as we saw in the best example in the world, Joggins. During normal, modern day erosional processes, the harder rocks withstand erosion better than the softer rocks. And so the harder rocks are left sticking up as reefs of rocks, but the planation surface showed even Stephen erosion of all rock layers, regardless of hardness, as the water sought out its own level. As the waters slowed down though, the water has less energy to erode the rocks. And so at some point you begin to get this differential erosion going on. The softer rocks are eroding faster than the harder rocks, and so harder rocks or cracks in the surface of the rocks begin to redirect the water flow into channels. 
This channelization of water is still incredibly powerful, but now more focused, and these channels of water begin to erode away around any planation surfaces it just made. So it can leave behind these flattened hilltops and mountaintops as it begins to erode the landscape and carve channels and canyons. Now, once eroded, some of these canyons remain fairly high in elevation and no longer have a river flowing through them. In many cases though, the freshly eroded canyon directs precipitation and runoff into rivers which now flow through the canyons. So when we see canyons around the world, like Grand Canyon, where the National Park Service will tell you that over many tens of millions of years, that mighty Colorado River carved this huge canyon, we need to stop and ask some questions. Did the river form the canyon or did the canyon form the river? You see, it's well and all to make the suggestion that the Colorado River carved Grand Canyon, but it's actually a ridiculous suggestion for multiple reasons. First, the mighty Colorado River ain't that mighty. Furthermore, such a model would require the river to flow uphill for thousands of vertical feet. Here's a 3D model of the Grand Canyon region, and the canyon here actually cuts through a gigantic dome uplift right here. The land actually bowls upward. And so the river traveling in this direction would actually have to go uphill for thousands of feet to go over the crest of the mountain. And that is what you would call a hill that was thousands of feet high. And begin carving the Grand Canyon. Notice something else very unusual, which we are going to visit in just a few moments. Notice that the river could have gone around the Colorado uplift. In fact, it could have gone around in two different places, here or here. Yet the river seemed to specifically go out of its way to do the impossible and climb thousands of feet to go up and over this mountain and to start cutting the canyon. Now, obviously, this defies all physics, logic, and reason. And so the proposition that the Colorado River carved Grand Canyon is nothing less than ridiculous. If you assume geological processes in the past were the same as they were today, and there was no historic global flood. Because if the waters that carved Grand Canyon started at an elevation higher than the Colorado uplift, oh, then it's a whole different ballgame. No, the canyon caused the river, not the other way around. Now, keep all of this in mind. During the Bill Nye Ken Ham debate of 2014, Bill Nye said, And by the way, if this great flood drained through the Grand Canyon, wouldn't there have been a Grand Canyon on every continent? How can we not have Grand Canyons everywhere? if this water drained away in this extraordinary short amount of time, 4,000 years. Now, despite our differences, Mr. Nye is absolutely correct. If there has been a global flood, then yes, there should be Grand Canyons on every single continent. But before I address that point, let's first turn his argument on its head. If the puny Colorado River carved Grand Canyon, then every river on planet Earth that's been flowing for tens of millions of years should have carved Grand Canyons. You can't have it both ways. But what's interesting is that apparently Mr. Nye was blissfully unaware that there is Grand Canyons on every continent. And in fact, Grand Canyon is one of the smaller ones. That's right, in North America alone, 
Hell's Canyon and Copper Canyon are both deeper, wider, and longer than Grand Canyon. These canyons also both exhibit this strange phenomenon of having cut right through mountains when the waters that cut the mountains or the waters that cut the canyons could have and should have gone around the mountain. Instead, the waters seem to have climbed uphill for thousands of vertical feet in order to start cutting the canyon through the mountain when it could have gone around the mountain. Now let's back up a second and take a closer look at this phenomenon. This is the Rattlesnake Mountains in Wyoming and you can just barely see the Buffalo Bill hydroelectric dam back there blocking off this impressive canyon near Cody, Wyoming. I love this stuff. I'm an engineer, so engineering stuff is cool to me. Anyway, take a close look at this incredibly narrow and deep canyon cut right through the middle of this huge mountain. Now, let's take a short drive in behind the dam. Here we are looking towards the dam from the reservoir. There's the canyon cutting through the mountain. But now, let's turn to the right. Wait a minute. Look at, look at over here. The mountain ends right there. In fact, when they built the Buffalo Bill Dam, they had to build a coffer dam over here in order to keep the water in the reservoir from going around the mountain. So that river that they dammed up, did the river cause the canyon or did the canyon cause the river? Let's take a look at this in a 3D model of the area. This phenomenon is called a water gap. Basically, a water gap is a canyon or gorge that was cut through a mountain when the water could have gone around the obstacle. It makes no sense in a deep time model. Not even deep time models that allow catastrophes because the irrational, illogical, and unscientific dogma of all deep time models is that there has not been a past worldwide flood. You see, a worldwide flood has water starting above the mountains and moving at tremendous velocity. So when the mountains began to rise up as the waters of the global flood left the land, those waters were moving in a set direction and thus just eroded their way through the mountains that rose up in front of them. There are no problems raised by water gaps for flood geologists, but impossible problems are raised for the advocates of deep time who claim the river carved the canyons. And thus they must explain away physics and natural law requiring that some way, somehow, a river went uphill for thousands of feet to start cutting a canyon. Now, some deep time advocates would argue that the river found a fault in the mountain and followed it. Now, while there may be faults documented at places in the world where the waters could have you know, worked the fault and eroded it into a canyon, most of the time, the exact opposite is the case. The faults in such canyons are all well, ma well mapped and documented by the geologists. Do you think they're gonna build a huge hydroelectric dam on a fault? Now, I do not know how many water gaps around the world have faults that follow in the direction of the canyon. I would have to be omniscient for that one because there are literally thousands of water gaps all over the world. But the ones I know of the faults that have been documented all run perpendicular to the canyons. So much for the fault theory. So, if you have a canyon originally carved by water, when the water could have gone around the obstacle, but there's no longer a river flowing through the canyon, that is what is called a wind gap. There are 
thousands of wind gaps all over the world as well. Wind gaps and water gaps are an absolute impossible mystery to anyone who denies a past global flood. Oye and Payne spent a great deal of time in their book discussing the incredible and mysterious phenomenon of water gaps that are found in the mountains literally all over the world. Grand Canyon is just one of thousands, one of the thousands of water gaps found all around the world. Hell's Canyon, which cuts through Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, is so huge that it's difficult to appreciate it. And unlike Grand Canyon, you can drive right up the bottom of the canyon. Geologist Brent Carter took me up Hell's Canyon to check out the geology. It's twice as wide as Grand Canyon, and at just shy of 8,000 feet deep, it's more than a quarter mile deeper than Grand Canyon. The waters that cut it could have gone in several different directions to avoid going uphill, but instead the waters decided to go straight through the mountains because of reasons, you know. Copper Canyon in Mexico is composed of six different canyons cutting east-west through the mountains of the Sierra Madre Occidental. Slightly deeper than Grand Canyon, Copper Canyon is almost four times longer than Grand Canyon, and the waters that carved it had to go up thousands of feet in order to carve the canyons. The deepest point of the Rio Marignon Canyon of Peru is some 10,000 feet deep, more than half again Grand Canyon's depth. But... Let us not leave out Greenland. Though currently covered by incredibly thick ice sheets, it has a massive canyon that was discovered by an international team of scientists in 2013 using ground-penetrating radar. Now, while it's not as deep as Grand Canyon, it's still some 800 meters or 2,600 feet deep, but possibly took the world record as the longest canyon in the world at 750 kilometers or 466 miles long. Antarctica also has several massive canyons buried underneath its ice cap. Interestingly, most of them extend below what is currently sea level. The Denman Canyon is so astonishingly deep that just the portion that's below sea level is 3,500 meters or 11,500 feet deep. I have not brought up subsea canyons for your consideration. Subsea canyons are found at every major river flowing into the oceans, and the Denman Canyon brings up an interesting point. Evidently, sea level was considerably lower for a time than it is today. Now, I'll come back to that throughout the series, but for the moment, the point being that there is Grand Canyons on every continent, including Antarctica, just as would be expected if there had been a global flood like the Bible records. Over in the Himalayan mountain range, the highest mountains on Earth, of course, give rise to the deepest canyons and mysterious water gaps found on Earth. The Yarlung Tsangpo Grand Canyon in Tibet is slightly longer than Grand Canyon in the US, but as the Yarlung Siangpo Mountain River passes by Mount Namcha Barwa, the canyon's average depth is about 5,000 meters or 16,000 feet. Its deepest point is over 6,000 meters or 19,714 feet. Did the Yarlung Siangpo River carve the Siangpo Grand Canyon? Or did the Siangpo Grand Canyon form the river? The river had absolutely no reason, no driving force to go uphill and over thousands of vertical feet of mountain peaks to start cutting a canyon. So it's quite safe to say that the canyon caused the river. But just west of there, the Arun River water gap cuts through Mount Everest. Again, a river with no reason nor means to flow uphill to crest mountains 
and cut a canyon through Mount Everest that's over six kilometers or some four miles deep. You can start to see why T. Oberlander, writing about the numerous water gaps found around the world and specifically mentioning the Zagro Mountains in Iran, remarked in amazement, the Zagros drainage pattern is distinctive by virtue of its disregard of major geological obstructions, both on a general scale and in detail. Certain streams ignore structure completely. Some appear to seek obstacles to transect. Others are deflected by barriers only to breach them at some point near their termini. Many streams cut in and out of anticlines or ridges without transecting them completely, and a few cross the same barrier more than once in reverse direction. It's all a huge mystery. However, if you start with the mountains underwater in the context of a global flood, all of this evidence fits perfectly. Mount Everest itself is quite interesting as even deep time geologists agree it was once underwater. I have here some fossil clams. I have found fossil clams like these all over North America. In fact, the dinosaur fossil beds of, North, of Western North America, fossil clams are the most common fossil, not the dinosaur fossils. But these clams tell a story. They're buried closed. Many of you have probably seen dead clams. How did you know they were dead? Because when they die, they fall open. Now, there are some mollusks which actually stay closed when they die because the muscles actually pull the shell open. So when they die, the shell stays closed. But not these, these ones. Uh, nor any of the clams that I have found buried uh, clothes like this in numerous places around North America. These fossil clams have been buried alive. Scientists conducting cruel experiments on helpless clams discovered that you have to rapidly bury the clams under a minimum of tens of feet of mud to trap and kill them by burying them alive. The clams can dig their way to the surface from incredible depths if they are rapidly buried. Yet when you find such fossil clams buried alive, you usually find them by the thousands in massive beds. Did you know that the top 3,000 feet or so of Mount Everest is covered in fossilized clams, many buried alive in the closed position? Last I checked, clams are lousy mountain climbers, but they beat Sir Edmund Hillary to the top by millennia. In fact, every major mountain range on planet Earth has fossilized sea life contained within its rocks. The Appalachians, the Rockies and Alaskan ranges, the Andes, the Swiss Alps, and yes, even the Himalayans. In fact, that's a key factor geologists use in identifying volcanic mountains, is if it doesn't have fossils. So when you bring up this point with geologists, they are quick to agree that Mount Everest was once underwater, but it rose up from the seafloor. I totally agree. But as Ollier and Payne took great pain to point out, all of the major mountain ranges on Earth rose up at the same time, and they all have fossilized sea life in them. Furthermore, you can trace those rock layers containing fossilized sea life from the mountains down into what is now the lowlands. You can do this for every major mountain range on planet Earth. Well, if all the continents were on the ocean floor at the same time, what do you have? You have a global flood. So, Mr. and I made a very valid point to which I completely agree, that if there was a global flood, like my Bible says, there should be Grand Canyons everywhere. I was frankly incredulous that he would say there wasn't. Of course there is Grand Canyons everywhere. What I have shared here was merely scratching the surface. 
In no way was what I shared here an exhaustive list of major canyons around the globe. I just focused on the really, really big ones. There was dozens that are quite impressive that I have not even mentioned. And this is common knowledge. Was I really that ignorant of the facts? I find that hard to believe, especially when the Greenland Canyon and the Antarctic Canyons I mentioned were brought to the attention of the world with much fanfare by the scientific community literally only a few months before Nye made those fateful statements during his debate with Ken Ham. But I think this was all part of his sad descent into madness. He rejected true science in his attempt to defend the evolution myth. And the great flood of Noah's day is at the foundation of that debate. He has no grounds on which to stand to reject the overwhelming evidence for the great global flood of Noah's day. Yet reject it, it or reject it all, is precisely what he has done. But in, enough about him. Where do you stand? Are you also going to reject the overwhelming evidence before you? Coming up in the next Complete Creation. Most of the rock layers, like the fossil clam layer on the top of Mount Everest, are regional in size. In fact, that's one of the reasons we know so much detail about the fossil content and types of rocks at the top of Mount Everest. The Friendship Highway of Lhasa to Kathmandu has rock cuts cutting through those very layers of rock 90 kilometers or 55 miles away from Mount Everest. Those layers continue much farther than that. In other words, you can follow those layers across provincial or state boundaries, crossing through multiple countries, and sometimes stratigraphic layers can even be traced across multiple continents, like the Austin Chalks that the late Dr. Derek Ager mentioned. That means all of the continents were flat and underwater at the same time. It's only logical. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support.